so as I say, um, Julian Stewart sort of set the stage. A lot of people came after and did kind of cultural ecology kind of work in the 1950s and really got anthropologists thinking about, again, about human beings as part of an ecosystem, that our cultures are not just sort of, uh, again, castles in the sky, but that we're actually rooted in an environment. It does not determine everything, but it does shape a lot of things, or at least some things, and that we have to think about that. Um, we then started to see the rise of a proper field of study called ecological anthropology and a more rigorous use of the ecosystem concept. So even though Julian Stewart was calling it cultural ecology, um, some of his understandings of ecology were, and some of the people who came after them, weren't quite as rigorous into the ecology side as they could have been. In the 60s, you started to see a much more deliberate use of concepts from ecology in anthropology uh, to explain cultures. So to explain that, though, we kind of have to talk a little bit about the world outside anthropology, as much as we hate to do that, right? Why should we have to talk about the world outside anthropology? We should just talk about anthropology. No, of course not. Uh, like any other scientific discipline, we exist in a cultural context. Um, so in a sense, ecology is as old as anything else in life, right? We've been wondering about the world around us and making observations about it uh, since time immemorial. Um, the scientific discipline that we specifically call ecology within sort of the um, post-enlightenment scientific apparatus, that as a field is relatively new. Um, you had certainly biologists and wildlife biologists, but ecology as sort of a distinctive field really gained prominence in the 20th century. And particularly in the um, 1950s and 60s, it went from being an important field in academia, but to one that was became increasingly important and was recognized by the public, and specifically the idea of ecosystems, um, in part because of books like this, a very, very influential book by Henry Odom called Fundamentals of Ecology. And the fact that I own a copy is just something I am very happy about. Um, this book, originally published in the 50s um, by Henry Odom, presented a case for, as did other ecologists around that same time period, the animals were not just sort of their own species by themselves or even beings that were just affected by maybe one or two other species that they ate or were eaten by, but instead that you had to understand the entire environment as a system, as an ecosystem, as a, in Odom's view, a circle, a cycle of energy, right, moving around the system. Um, Short-tailed weasel eats lemming, procures some of, burns some of the energy off, but procures some of it into its own body, who's in turn eaten by snowy owl, who procures some of the energy in its own body, who then dies and is decomposed by microorganisms and worms, thus returning some of the nutrients and energy back into the soil, right, and around and around we go. Um, some of the energy loss, is, sometimes the energy itself is sort of a open loop in the sense that um, we, it eventually just dissipates, right? through entropy, comes in through sunlight and then dissipates. But other things like nitrogen or phosphorus form actually cycles that move through the system over and over and over again. But the idea of an environment like a system, um, a whole, a puzzle really, this it would be hard to overstate how influential this idea was. It would be very difficult. It is one of those ideas that has now become so commonplace that we think of it as common sense, but it was not always common sense by any means. Back in the early 20th century, people saw, a lot of people, for example, in the U.S., saw absolutely no problem with exterminating every single wolf out there and, in fact, would pay people um, to go out and shoot wolves and bring back their ears as proof that they'd shot them, or coyotes, actually, um, more commonly, I think. They saw absolutely no problem with this because it was just, okay, well, we get rid of that animal that's, let's say, a nuisance in our view for one reason or another, and that'll be fine. The When the 50s and 60s saw people making a real strong claim for ecosystems, part of the point that was making was that you can't just take species out of an environment willy-nilly. You can't just, you know, sort of tightly control um, an environment and expect it to work the way it should. As another example, at a site that I do work on, um, I do some of my anthropology research at a site called um, the Sacred Grove up in western New York. It's a historic site for a religion up there. But 
back in the early 20th century and mid 20th century, people would straight up rake the leaves um, and remove them from the site because it was thought that it made the area like messy. Um, of course, now we would think that is like a terrible idea. The leaves are important. Leave the leaves. The leaves help replenish the soil, right? And they also provide habitat for like little bugs and things that help the ecosystem work. So there's a reason that your forest is looking more and more bare bones because you're taking out the nutrient cycle. So again, nowadays it's like super common sense. At the time it was not. So it was a big idea. It worked its way into the public consciousness. It definitely influenced things like um, Earth Day, the newfound environmental movement, influenced a lot of the laws, important laws that were passed in the 60s and 70s, such as NEPA and the Endangered Species Act. And the idea that we really do need to uh, sort of preserve all the pieces, if at all possible, because they're part of a system. Now, since that time, and even at the time, um, other ecologists kind of pushed back on this idea of an ecosystem as like a well-functioning machine, right, with a bunch of pieces, and instead to take more of a, um, is it Cleason or Clemens? Anyways, I think Clemens, Clemensian model, where um, animals and plants might overlap in an area, or they might not, and it's kind of messy and fuzzy, and there's not these really like clearly bounded ecosystems or food webs that are predictable. And so definitely a lot of ecology now kind of has elements of both, right? We understand that ecosystems definitely do have cycles to them and systematic interactions and one animal affects another. And you have things like keystone species that if you take out, everything goes haywire. On the other hand, a lot of species are not keystone species and they occur in an area partly because of the coincidence of how things have developed historically. And therefore it would not be correct to think of it as like a perfectly well-oiled machine, but instead we now understand that landscapes sometimes shift and certain species can replace other species without the system as a whole falling apart, um, and that systems have a certain amount of resiliency and redundancy built into them. Not endlessly so, but some amount of that. So our understanding of how ecosystems work, or even whether we should call them ecosystems, is really different now than it was back in the 50s. But at the time, this was cutting-edge ecology. It was a cutting-edge idea, and anthropologists wanted it on the game. They suddenly became very, very interested in this um, idea of ecosystem and some of the related ideas such as energy cycles and ecological niches. So you saw this with a bunch of research that came out in the late 50s and 60s. Um, so for example, Clifford Geertz studied um, rice paddy or soa agriculture as well as Sweden or um, what we sometimes call slash and burn horticulture in Indonesia. And he thought of, for example, rice paddy agriculture. He made the point that this is not some sort of irrational practice of flooding fields. Obviously, this is an entire ecosystem um, that is sort of human influenced ecosystem, a cultural ecosystem uh, that works very well. Same with um, Sweden or slash and burn that was previously viewed by many outsiders as irrational, as wasteful, but many anthropologists at the time, among others, made the case that this is a um, ecosystem in its own right. This is a way of returning nutrients back to the soil, allowing them to regrow over time and then using them again, and it's patterned and it's well ordered. You had people like um, Barth who did work on Pakistani agriculturalists and farmers in a specific valley, valley, and he found that there was at least three distinct niches. Niche is so in ecology, the idea of a niche is the idea that let's say um, a chickadee has a very specific kind of seed that it eats, and therefore you'll find it on a specific part of the tree, filling its specific role in the ecosystem. Barth applied this to human beings and specifically to ethnic groups in a Pakistani valley to suggest that three different ethnic groups had developed because of three different niches. There was people that were using the hillside for cattle raising. There were people that were using the valley floor, the nutrient-rich valley floor where all the soil sloped down into. We're using that for agriculture. And you had a third group who was doing kind of marginal pastoralism on the sides and also some farm growing. Three different niches being used by three different ethnic groups. Um, so again, applying ecosystem concepts to human cultures in a really kind of provocative, interesting way, right? Bringing up the fact that um, we aren't just sort of absolute controllers of our ecosystems, nor are we absolute strangers to our ecosystems, but instead humans are part of ecosystems in an interesting way, or we're affected by ecosystems, or at least we sometimes kind of follow some of the same principles, like niches, like cycling, um, that exist in natural ecosystems. So that was interesting. Um, I really wanted to find an example that, to be blunt, wasn't male. Um, 
the cultural ecologists and the ecological anthropologists working in the 50s and 60s, a lot of them were male at the time for a lot of different reasons. There were other kinds of environmental anthropologists where there were more um, female scholars, but this was definitely a kind of ecosystem anthropology as I'm defining. It was pretty male-centric at this time period, although I would like to briefly mention the um, very interesting work done by Louise Sweet at the time in the 50s. She did research in Kuwait and she studied Bedouin um, camel pastoralism, and one of the things she found is that people relied extremely heavily on camels as a milk resource. They rarely used them for meat, mainly under specific ritual um, times, but they drew the vast majority of their nutrients from milk from camels. But one of the things that she found was that, you know, that was a very good adaptation to that landscape. Again, using kind of ecological ideas, um, able to process these plant materials and make them into edible milk. And also she found, though, that the nature of the environment and the adaptation to the environment and of camels was such that because camels reproduce really rather slowly, therefore it's hard to build up a big herd. And also because it's this spaced out desert environment, it's easy for other people to raid um, your environment. And so therefore it made sense to have kind of a kinship structure built around clans that when needs be, or fucked as they are in the original language, um, these clans could help oversee disputes if one group raided another group because the environment was such that it almost encouraged raiding, particularly because if a, if your camel, um, if you're, you know, two camel children, I don't know what a young camel is called, calf? Anyway, if you're two camel calves in your entire herd, because they reproduce so slow, if those camels get killed for some reason, um, if they die for some reason, it might be very tempting to go raid the next um, band over, the next family over. And so these clans developed as sort of this structure by which to um, administer um, claims over this such essential resource. At least that was Louise Sweet's argument. I think there's a lot more to it than that, but it was an interesting argument sort of how environmental factors of camels and deserts um, and the space between communities would have such a profound effect on human culture. So we've come a long way from um, not considering the environment at all, right? Suddenly we have people considering things like hillside slopes and where soil accumulates, um, how rice grows, or how camels gestation period works as key factors in cultural development. All more about, and we'll have, take that concept even further with a really interesting individual, Roy Rappaport, once I do the next video.